be seen that features people from prop, including me, and the voices of other people. And it's uh, I think a, a, a dramatic presentation of Brooklyn Windows policing and the harm it does to people, primarily low-income people of color, every day, and also on some of the some of the remedies or solutions to what changes have to take place in order to stop abusive and discriminatory policing. So we're going to show the video. Uh, I think it's about eight minutes. Then I'll make a brief presentation. Then hopefully we can engage in some back and forth. Thank you. If you're poor or a person of color, you're much more likely to be fucked over. There's something wrong with policing. People between the ages of 18 and 34, they did not experience the New York of 1990 when the city was going to hell the handbasket. The problem with broken windows, cops overtly police in different ways depending on who you are. They ticket and they arrest people who have little or no ability politically to push back. It's fucked up and it demeans us as a city, it demeans us as a country. I'm the director of PROP, the Police Reform Organizing Project. We focus on exposing abuse or discriminatory police practices. Robert Ganji is a longtime critic of Broken Windows. Broken Windows is a philosophy. It's been translated into a form of policing that's applied by the NYPD. The notion is if the government takes steps to prevent low-level infractions, like graffiti, jaywalking, chicken beer, and your stoop, it's going to represent an effective strategy at curbing serious crime, like rape and homicide and armed robbery. It's a theory that's never been proven. It targets long-term people of color. The powers that be should stop it. You have to educate these families. They need to learn core values. I think that actually helps. The, the whole broken window effect. If you stop the person from drinking on the curb, well, maybe you'll stop them going into selling drugs. One of our more successful actions, we went into Park Slope, and we gave out mock summonses to white people who were riding like on a sidewalk, jaywalking. <laughs> But it's just those kind of infractions that the police regularly harass, ticket, even arrest people of color for. Well, uh, you're going to see 500 people doing what I just did. All of this is not falling in the boat. Broken windows, please, if you're out of broken windows, please. Broken windows is a policy that comes from on top. It's the pressure from Bratton, from the boat commanders, from precinct commanders, for cops to make their numbers. So this is East Harlem, and I would say this is an area where you're today seeing a lot of the issues around broken windows policing play out. Good evening, everybody. My name is Carl Berkeley. I'm a retired New York City detective. The broken windows theory, depending on how you use it, is a valuable tool. You don't use it to abuse it. We as communities of color have become so accustomed to having officers be a part of our daily life. What I would push people to think about are to remove the police from our neighborhoods altogether. Do not have cops in the community, remove them from the community. That's not what he said. That's not what he said. If you don't have one of these, these police are going to violate your rights. You better get educated. Just because you're black or Hispanic, let me tell y'all right now, some of the most racist officers out there are black and Hispanic. Don't get it twisted, all right? And there are some good white officers out there, but your own kind can treat you the worst. You're under surveillance all the time. We need less officers because it is expensive, and this is money that we can be utilizing in our neighborhoods. I think that we deserve better police and the water and broken window is the reason for the abuse. Anybody going into the project in the community is a uh, savage, look at those savages. I told them, you know, my mom is a savage. She lives in one of those apartments. Two Latino men were allegedly arrested for manspreading. A young African-American woman, the officer charged her with being in a park after dust. The squeegee pass, we're not being overwhelmed. Those will be taken care of very, very quickly. Because there's no mainstream politician who will support what I just laid out. Because essentially what I just laid out would result in a significant reduction in the number of people who work for the police department. I completely disagree with what you're saying. Because broken windows does work. 
a couple of weeks ago, some guy who had his fear upon a train, mm -hmm. and the cops went up to him, and they questioned him, and that's what he turned out to be. I don't know. So, so he was a guy. I believe it. The cops arrest. The cops arrest. Literally hundreds of thousands of people for things like that in the Philippines. Because one of those arrests caught someone who had a serious. It had a serious criminal history? No. Why, does, why are the cops doing sufficiently the police work so they catch that guy? He was blatantly lying. He said, white folks don't get stopped by open containers. I got four open containers right in front of my door last year for having a uh, red cup of beer. Did you say that I lied? Yes, you did. Right over there. I said, for the most part, these offenses have been decriminalized in white communities, and that's true. Well, that's but, that's 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 at this breakfast. I also want to apologize for the first 30 seconds of that video <laughs> where I used the F word twice. Um, I was not aware. They interviewed me literally for hours. So that was a function of editing where they would have me say the F word twice in the first 30 seconds. And uh, just to give you a little picture of my family life, when we got that video from Elite Daily, I sat down with my wife to watch it, <laughs> and she saw me curse twice in the first 30 seconds, and she got so mad at me that 
she just got up from the table where we were sitting and refused to watch the rest of the video. Her point being, how can you be so stupid to use a word that some people are going to find offensive when you're trying to convince people about how harmful broken windows policing is. So we have two sons. Uh, one is 30, about to be 39, uh, and uh, our other son is 43. So I called them, I had sent them the video, and I asked them what they thought. Did they think it was going to uh, uh, be counterproductive, to use that kind of language? They were both very comfortable with it um, uh, and had no problem with it. Um, I see there's some disagreement, some support from my wife's view at this table. Um, and, uh, but again, I wanted to apologize. Uh, um, it was not my intent to um, say anything that would be offensive, particularly since so much of the challenge for us is to convince people uh, and, and a broad constituency of people just how harmful uh, broken windows policing, quota-driven broken windows policing is. Uh, as a segue, coming out of the presentation by uh, the man from the Innocence Project, when he talks about, and when you guys talk about, how um, the Queens District Attorney, uh, I'm forgetting his name, what's the name of the Queens District Attorney? Yeah. Richard, Richard Brown. How unresponsive he is to uh, just reasonable uh, uh, request, reasonable advocacy to open up cases where there is very likely been a miscarriage of justice. When you hear from the Innocent Project person, also forgetting his name, that the NYPD does not have any policies that protect against uh, uh, false confessions, it is not surprising. One of the basic principles to be aware of when you consider the problems with how the police operate, how district attorneys operate, and how criminal justice system operates. It's this old saying that I remember learning in high school. I forgot who said it, but that power corrupts, and absolute power corrupts absolutely. And the criminal justice system, again, police departments and district attorneys have extraordinary power and it's unchecked power. Uh, they have the power to uh, lock people up, deprive them of their liberty. They have the problem when you go to the DA to prosecute people and send people to prison. Again, it's extraordinary power. Again, it is unchecked, particularly in New York City. So it is not surprising that corruption sets in and it's not surprising, given the way we know how powerful institutions work, that and I'm going to talk particularly about the NYPD, that the NYPD engages in abusive and discriminatory practices every day. So the, I think most of you probably have a good sense of broken windows policing very quickly. As I said in the video, uh, it's a philosophy of policing. It came out of an article that was published in the Atlantic Monthly in 1982, so it's a long time ago. It was implemented in New York first, by Commissioner Bill Bratton, who most of you are familiar with. Whoops. Apologize for that. That was a uh, the NYPD trying to subvert my presentation. Uh, the uh, implemented by Bill Bratton when he first became commissioner in 1994. Uh, he was appointed by uh, Rudy Giuliani. We all remember him. Um, and he then, as we all know, was brought back to be the commissioner in New York City in 2014 by uh, Bill de Blasio. It's interesting to point out that Branton was the only high-level appointment by uh, de Blasio that did not have a history of being a reformer. Every other commissioner of every other large city agency had a history of being a reformer before they took office, but not Bill Branton. And one of the things that I find most dramatic about that video is when it quotes Bratton as saying, we do not target communities of color, we target behavior. Now that is a lie. Uh, if it's not a lie, it's a function of his not knowing what his own police department does. Either way, it's an extraordinary failure of leadership. Um, 
just to, and I'm sure most of you are familiar with the racial bias of policing, but just to give you uh, some examples. Um, last year, the uh, highest category of arrest by the NYPD was for something called theft of service. Theft of service is the legal term for fare evasion. Over 29,000 arrests for theft of service last year by the NYPD, the largest category of arrests. In addition to the 29,000 and change arrests, the NYPD, and this is a staggering number, issued over 123,000 summonses for theft of service or fair evasion. A total of over 150,000 punitive interactions that the NYPD had with New Yorkers in 2015. We don't have the racial breakdown of the numbers in terms of the people who received the summonses, but we have the racial breakdown of the arrests. And of the 29,000 or so arrests, 92% involved New Yorkers of color, 92%. It is a blatantly racist practice. It targets not only people of color, it targets poor people. Most people who jump the turnstile don't do it for the thrill of it, they do it because it's actually a financial burden for them to take the subways um, or, or the uh, buses in the city. And we all know that people cannot live in New York City, cannot get to work, cannot get to job interviews, cannot take care of their children, or cannot get to school or to college unless they use public transportation. So poor people have to have access to public transportation. But in effect, the policy of the de Blasio administration is not to help poor people manage to use public transportation, it's to punish them and to criminalize them. Um, and we support, along with uh, an organized movement led by the Riders Alliance and the Community Service Society, a campaign to provide reduced fares for poor people. Actually, position and prop is it should be free fare for poor people in New York City uh, so that they can have that much more of a chance to live a productive life um, and not be harassed and targeted by the police and the criminal justice system. So, the, so much of the, I'll give you one more dramatic statistic that documents the racial bias. Actually, I'll give you a couple. Um, the, all the research shows that white people use and sell marijuana in equal or greater proportion uh, to African Americans and Latinos. Last year, the NYPD made over 20,000 arrests for the possession and sale of small amounts of marijuana. Over 20,000 arrests. 92.5% people of color. Again, a blatantly racist practice. A uh, DA, an assistant DA, reached out to me anonymously to talk to me about the things that troubled, I didn't want to uh, reveal the gender, troubled this person uh, in, in uh, the work that this person witnessed and how DAs operate. And the person told me that in the borough where the person works, the NYPD has undercover drug operations focused on marijuana and only in African American and Latino communities, not in white communities. We um, have a court monitoring project at PROP, and what that project involves is PROP volunteers and interns, and I, including me, um, we go into the arraignment parts of the city courts. Um, the on a regular basis. And the value of that is it enables us to keep track of NYPD arrest practices without depending on whatever spin comes out of uh, City Hall or out of the NYPD's press office. The, the, it's important to note that everybody who gets arrested in New York City is arraigned. Everybody. So that if you go into the arraignment parts in Queens, Bronx, Brooklyn, and Manhattan on a regular basis, you will get a very good idea about the NYPD's arrest practices. So um, we have looked at and observed 
over 2,300 cases that we have reported on since 2014. We've actually observed many more cases than that, but we haven't issued reports yet. And out of the 2,300 cases, over 90% involved New Yorkers of color. And we go into the misdemeanor arraignment parts, actually in Queens, the, both the felonies and misdemeanors are heard in the same arraignment part. We concentrate on misdemeanors because our intent, and it's an unapologetic intent, is to expose and end broken windows policing. So we're not looking so much at, at felony arrest practices. And the, we have rarely, if ever, seen a case where somebody is being arraigned for a misdemeanor in New York, where that person, by any stretch of the imagination, could be considered a dangerous criminal, a predatory criminal. It's, um, sometimes it's people just going through the ordinary course of their day who the police have arrested. Sometimes it's homeless people or mentally ill people. Um, the, and it, again, in over 90% of the cases, it's people of color. I've been into, the last three times I, I looked at arraignments in Manhattan, over the course of three different visits, I saw 65 cases. Every case, a New Yorker of color. Not one white person. Um, there's no question that what Grant said in that video is just flatly untrue. Over here? Yeah, as it relates to, you was talking about transportation. Another uh, consideration, I don't know if you focused on that, is the quota system as it relates to the uh, car stops, which has a severe economic uh, impact also. Okay, have you focused on that? Because a lot of people are saying it's disproportionate, uh, you know, it's um, heavy in terms of uh, hitting minorities. Right. Uh, also. We, we focus very much on the quota system. The, the, the video doesn't have very much about the quota system. The quota system is, but it's important to emphasize and to enlighten people about it. The police operate under a quota system. I mean, Bratton denied it, the leadership always denies it, they have to deny it because the quota system is illegal by state law. Uh, but there's no question that the NYPD has a quota system. Cops have told us this, anybody who looks at the NYPD knows that there's at least an informal quota system. And what it means is, again, it's a management tool for, the, for police officers. The performance of police officers is evaluated almost entirely on the number of arrests they make, the number of summonses they give out, the number of stops they make. So a police officer's performance, again, is measured entirely. Can people hear me? No. Hello? Hello? You kicked it out. Hello? Can't go too far. Can't go too far. <laughs> it could have taken me half out to figure out why the mic wasn't working. Hello? Uh, the, uh, so police officers' performance is based entirely on the number of punitive interactions they gauge in in a given month. And that, it, there's no question that that leads police officers to target people and to arrest and give summons to people unnecessarily when they're engaged in innocuous activities, and sometimes the police officers will just make things up. This, uh, the assistant DA who came to speak to me anonymously, one of the things that DA said to me, and these, these were the person's words, is cops lie all the time to substantiate the charges that they bring against people. How shocking. <laughs> Oh, hold on one second. I want to finish this, but what also is, is pernicious about the quota system is the cops, cops, get, cops get credit for making the arrest, or giving out the summons, as soon as they make the arrest and give out the summons. So if it is, excuse me, I'll use uh, harsh language again, if it's a bullshit arrest or a bogus summons, they get the notch on the belt anyway. So that the quota system is actually an incentive to bad policing. And there's no question, I had a conversation with a police officer a couple of weeks after the Eric Garner incident. Uh, I was making a deposit in my local bank. There's a cop there, uh, posted there, and I overheard him telling the bank staff that the cops who arrested Garner uh, made serious mistakes, needless to say. 
So I engage him in a conversation, and in the course of it, he, because at one point I said to him, what was terrible about the Garner incident, in part, was he wasn't doing anything really wrong. I mean, he was selling loose cigarettes, and that would have been the ninth time that they arrested him for selling loose cigarettes. And the cop explained to me there's a quota system, and the quota system applies differently in different precincts. So precincts that serve communities of color have a high quota, precincts that serve well-to-do white communities have either no quota or a much smaller quota. Then he also said to me, uh, I mean, this wasn't surprising, but to hear it come out of his mouth, um, uh, it was instructive and informative. He used to work in Brooklyn, and he used to work uptown in Harlem. I live on West 86th Street in Manhattan, so he referred to Harlem as uptown. And, he's, and when he worked in Brooklyn, he worked in an Orthodox Jewish community. And he said to me, without any trace of anti-Semitism, I will never arrest an Orthodox Jewish person because they make your life miserable. Um, because they have connections, they have resources, uh, they'll have high-powered attorneys. Uh, so, and he said, I'm not happy about this. It's the black and Latino kids who are the low-hanging fruit. Because he didn't go into it in this kind of detail. Because I can arrest them. I can give them tickets, and nobody's going to give me a hard way to go. Um, and and um, again, and I'll use that word pernicious, what's pernicious about all this is that the cops, in, on a, it's not every police officer, but many, many police officers, on a daily basis, engage in abusive and discriminatory practices, and there's no consequence. I mean, we see there's, a con there's no consequence even in egregious cases. We see all the police officers, including Dan Pantaleo, who put the chokehold on Ghana, still work for the police department. I mean, forget that they weren't indicted. Forget that they weren't fired. They still work for the police department. And then there was a couple of articles in the Daily News several weeks ago that showed that Dan Pantaleo one year made almost $120,000 because he's been put on modified duty and he's been able to work overtime. That is in and of itself a scam. Uh, the, there was a, a notorious case, I don't know, a year, year and a half ago, uh, captured on video where a police officer jumped in through the ground, uh, a man named James Blake, a black man who used to be a very successful tennis player. That police officer still works for the NYPD. And not only does he still work for the NYPD, all the police officers who did not report the use of force. It's an NYPD requirement. They just, every use of force is supposed to be reported. None of those police officers reported the use of force. They still work for the NYPD. And this, this goes to the point I made at the very beginning about unchecked power is, leads to corruption. It is inevitable. Um, and the, the, there's not a, we're supposed to end at 11. Kevin, so I want to leave at least some time for questions and back and forth, but let me just say one final point. So what we propose to end abusive and discriminatory policing, which again, needless to say to the people in this room, is not new. The videos are new, but what the videos capture are not new. Policing in New York City, and in fact in every large urban jurisdiction in our country, uh, has been abusive and discriminatory since the founding of police departments in the 19th century. Um, so the proposals that we're making are, will be considered, uh, uh, if you're looking at the political spectrum, will be considered radical proposals, fundamental change proposals. We do not think more training is gonna make much of a difference. We do not think more diversity having more black and Latino police officers is going to make much of a difference. Because any successful police officer in the department has to get with the program, whatever your race is. Um, uh, we do not think, we think body cameras could be useful in certain instances, but again, will not lead to fundamental change in police practices on a daily basis. And by the way, there are no body cameras. The NYPD, there's no police officer in New York City that wears body cameras. Um, so what we're proposing is, and this goes to in part to the point you're making, so for example, for traffic uh, infractions, we propose that that responsibility 
be taken away entirely from the police department? Why do you need an officer with a gun and a badge showing up when there's a car stuck on the highway? Why do you need a, uh, an officer with a gun and a badge to pull somebody over because they're driving with a broken tail end? Right now, uh, getting to the whole issue of punitive interactions, last year, 2015, because we did the research on this and we compiled all the numbers, the NYPD engaged in almost 1,800,000 punitive interactions for the course of the year with New Yorkers. That includes felony arrests, misdemeanor arrests, MTA summonses, and traffic violation tickets. Over a million of those punitive interactions were traffic violation tickets. Something I never heard of before, even though I've lived in the city all my life and I'm 72 years old, and it shocks you to know I'm 72, right? Given my youthful uh, um, whatever. In 2014 and 2015, NYPD gave out between 65 and 75,000 summonses for something called tinted windows. Right? Right? right. And guess who's driving those cars? Uh, um, uh, and the um, and over a hundred thousand tickets for disobeying a traffic sign. I mean, extraordinary uh, level of intrusive and punitive conduct targeting African American and Latino people. Uh, and um, to, when I said to my son, uh, the one who's about to be 39, well, we're going to recommend taking away traffic enforcement from the NYPD. He said, well, that's not going to happen. Um, and we also recommend, I'll just make one more point and then open it up to uh, some kind of back and forth. We're all aware of this terrible incident that occurred last week where a police officer shot and killed a 66-year-old black woman who was clearly seriously mentally ill. Completely unnecessary. And our recommendation is that 911 dispatchers, right now 911 dispatchers have two options, send a cop or send an ambulance. Our recommendation will be each 911 dispatcher has a list at his or her disposal of all the community service organizations and mental health professionals and church groups for each community in the city. And when a call comes in about an emotionally disturbed person, that dispatcher sends a mental health professional, yes. not a police officer. And if there's the, some need for the, at least the possibility of physical restraint, police come as backup, but they don't make any move um, without the, the way, let me just say, it. it's the decision, the decision to make a move is the mental health professional decision, not the police officers. Now again, and there's a, we have a number of these kind of recommendations. The theme of this, and I mentioned this in the video, is to significantly reduce the power and the responsibility of the police department. Reduce the budget, and reduce the personnel, and as this uh, woman is saying, that's not gonna happen. Our view is, it is very politically unrealistic, but if we're serious, as a society, as a government, to end racism,